Hello, and welcome back to the Road to 2000 class. As always, my name is Caleb Denby, and I will be your driver on this journey to 2000s. Um, today's lecture is going to be focused around a particular opening, which a lot of people sometimes think these classes aren't the most useful as the, the general topic classes. But I think focusing on one opening, uh, even if it's not an opening you're familiar with or an opening you play, uh, can be very, very useful because it introduces you to new plans and ideas that you might not be familiar with. And really, at, at the end of the day, chess is, is the same game no matter what opening you play. And so learning more ideas is, is always going to be helpful. Now, this opening in particular is a variation in the Nimzo Indian defense. So how many people are familiar with the Nimzo Indian defense? Hopefully all of you. OK. Well, let's put it on the board really quick. Starts with d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3. And then the move that denotes the Nemzo Indian is bishop b4. So black attacks this knight on c3, developing the bishop to a very far advanced square. And generally in the Nemzo Indian, uh, the big imbalance that is created is after this bishop captures this knight on c3, white kind of has a structural weakness with this b pawn coming to c3. And meanwhile, black is giving up the bishop pair quite early on. So if you notice, this move is attacking this knight and pinning it to the king. And this loosens white's control over the e4 square. And so the variation I want to talk about is a variation you've probably seen before if you've been coming to this class for a while. Uh, it's the f3 Nimzo. This is my personal favorite against the Nimzo Indian. You play f3 simply controlling the square once again and threatening to expand quite early on in the center. Now, uh, this isn't the most popular way to respond to the Nimzo, and black actually does have quite a few options here. So how many of you uh, ha have played either side of this opening before? Anybody? All right, Brian, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what are some, some various options for black here? It doesn't matter if you've played it or not before. What moves kind of come to mind against this f3? f3 move. <clears throat> if you're the black player here, what can you do? D5. Yeah, d5 is one of the most natural moves. Uh, and this is going to be a big topic of today's lecture, is what happens after people play d5. Uh, I think this is the most natural move. And so a lot of people, uh, a lot of class players in particular, and even players going above 2,000, uh, when they're creating their opening repertoire, uh, they'll say, OK, the f3 nimzo, nobody really plays that. I'll just play the most natural d5. My opponent wants to control this square. I'll attack this square and, and not give it to him. And that's kind of all they, they really look at. And so that's going to be the main subject of most of the games today, because players with the black pieces that I've faced have historically played this opening very, very poorly. And I've played some of the easiest games of chess of my life in, in this opening. I kind of just do the same thing every game, and it seems to be working pretty well. Um, this, like I said, this is one of my favorite variations. And so I wanted to talk about what they're doing wrong in this most natural d5 uh, opening and how strong players will play it differently. Uh, so that's going to be the main topic for tonight. But what other moves come to mind besides d5? Black can actually do a, a wide variety of things. What else comes to mind? Yeah, c5 is probably the most testing variation against the f3 Nimzo. White is saying, I want to control the light squares with this move f3. And c5 actually attacks a dark square. So as always in chess, you have to give something to, to take something. And so because uh, I wanted to take the light squares against c5, I now have to give the dark squares. So my dark squares are going to be weak in this opening variation. Meanwhile, I'll have a little bit of a central advantage on the light squares. So I'll have slightly more space. And this is kind of the big imbalance that the game is going to follow. So if you're looking for something to really take out the f3 Nimzo, c5 is, is the move for you. And then, OK, I'll, I'll ask you to try and find one more. One more move that, that seems potentially good. So we have, right now, a couple classical ways of approaching the center, right? Just occupying the center, pushing the pawns forward to challenge, challenge white's center. Maybe there is a more modern approach that could be taken. Okay. 
what other natural moves are there? It's not really like a big, you know, uh, puzzle where you have to try and find some unique, clever idea. You just play natural moves, and quite often those are correct early on in the opening. So I heard castles. What else? Knight c6. Knight c6? So knight c6 I'll talk about first. This move you actually want to be a little bit careful with. Um, knights going in front of the c-pawn can be a little bit misplaced sometimes because, like I said, a lot of times you want to play the c5 move or even c6 to, to support the center, and this knight could get in the way. But much more natural is to castle. And this is actually the, the line that I favor when I'm playing with the black pieces here. And it's kind of a funny line. Uh, how it's normally played is along these lines. And generally, black ends up with all its pieces on the back row. White gets the entire center. And the way the game goes is black eventually starts attacking the center uh, with moves like this. And white tries to checkmate black. And I think it makes for a very fun game. So all of this is to say that even on move four, the, the starting uh, position of the f3 nim, so black has a ton of options, which is why it's so strange to me uh, when I play this in tournament chess uh, against weaker players and against even, like I said, players over 2,000, they almost all exclusively play d5, which is, n in my opinion, the, the worst of these variations for black. Uh, this one get, actually gives white quite a lot of chances in the opening. So I might be, uh, you know, giving away all, all the secrets here, but I, I really don't think d5 is the move people should be playing. I really like the c5 line, and castles as well is, is also very good. But today, my opponent with the black pieces played a move that was not any of those three options. He captured on c3. So what do you guys think about this move? Any first impressions on bishop takes c3? And actually, this is a move that a couple people in the YouTube chat suggested. So my opponent was not alone in thinking that this was a good move. And that might give you a hint as to my opinion of the move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like you want to make them spend a move playing A3. That's exactly right. Um, Almost always in this opening, white ends up playing a3, forcing this bishop to make a decision, and then white wants to recapture with, with this b pawn. And so by playing bishop takes c3, you're actually giving up a very, very crucial tempo. Um, it's giving me the opportunity to not waste my time playing a3 myself. And because of that, I can use this time to do a lot more useful things than, than put a pawn on a3. Uh, probably the reason why my opponent was tempted to do this is a lot of times in the Nimzo, uh, white tries to play a move like queen c2 or a move like queen b3. And the point is, now, uh, let's say castles or something, now with a3, white sometimes wants to recapture this with a piece, keeping this pawn on b2 and preserving the, the structure. But really, that's not even ever, it's not ever an idea in the f3 Nimzo. We almost always take back with the b pawn. And the reason is we want to support our central pawn on d4. So bishop takes c3 is really just a misunderstanding of, of this opening. Uh, and so this is the, the first point I wanted to make. I know we're spending a lot of time on move 4, but I think there's a lot to be learned here just from these, these decisions. So obviously my opponent was not super familiar with the f3 nimzo. If he was familiar, he wouldn't have taken on c3. Uh, and so what should you do when you're unfamiliar with an opening? What do you fall back on? The basics. That's exactly right. You go back to your basic opening principles. What are the opening principles? Well, they tell you to control the center, play a move like d5 or c5. They tell you to castle your king. Or they tell you to develop your pieces, which in this case, maybe that's why you, you, fell, uh, you, you fell into knight c6. But even a move like, uh, let's, let's say, b6 would be much better than bishop takes c3. And I think even knight c6 is a better move than bishop takes c3. And so this is really a point I want to hammer home. Uh, a lot of players get to a point where they're like, they, they kind of just discount the opening principles because they, they think they're too good for them. But really, when you're unfamiliar with the opening, you should fall back on these principles because they lead you to the correct moves. Like these three main options are, are all following opening principles to a T. But instead, we see bishop takes c3, 
and b takes c3. My opponent then plays d5. So now he is controlling the center. I continue with c takes d5 and e takes d5. And now, yeah, let's see. Uh, I found a way to make uh, the opening very, very difficult for my opponent already, thanks to uh, some in inaccurate play on his part. So try and find a, a very annoying move. In fact, it, it might not even be the best move, but it is quite annoying for black to deal with. That is true. That is true. He took my only developed piece. Oh, yeah, in the back. G5, you mean? Yeah, bishop g5 isn't a bad idea. Uh, in this opening, though, it's, it's actually not as common as you might expect. Uh, usually, we have no problem playing this move e4. And so you, you might think, though, you want to take off this knight because it's controlling this important square. But really, this bishop's going to be a lot more valuable than this knight. And so we're not really ready to, to bring this bishop all the way out. Uh, did you have any idea? Uh, a3 or other? Yeah, that's actually entirely right. That's, that's what I played in the game, is bishop a3. So what makes this move so annoying? It's preventing something, right? It, it prevents castling. Of course, you can't castle through check. And at this moment in the game, I, I was like, well, I guess he's just never going to castle, because it seems really difficult to, right? Uh, and my opponent did, did come up with a clever way to, to get castled. But first, I want to say, Maybe better than playing bishop uh, a3 is just to continue normally. Just develop your pieces, and the extra tempo will, will make itself useful just by playing normally. So as always, playing normally, never a bad idea. But in the game, I thought bishop a3 made things a little bit annoying. So in the game, black played knight c6. I simply continue development. And then he plays knight e7. <laughs> And so this is how he, he chose to get castled. And uh, it, it's, it's actually still it, it's quite bad for black here. I think if you ask a computer, let's say it's, it's only uh, about plus one. But I, I think practically, this is already very, very close to very dangerous territory for black. I think black is, is close to losing already. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean we need to go crazy and open things up and try to kill him. We just develop our pieces with bishop d3. Black does get castled. I simply play knight e2. My opponent plays rook e8. And now I have a question for you. Should white play knight g3? Should white castle? Or none of the above? Should white play something else? Or does it matter? Am I just asking trick questions? Sometimes I do that. So this is actually an important one. So you can rule out the trick question option. Knight f4 seems good, someone in the YouTube chat says. Knight f4 from Irvin's. Natasha wants me to play king f2. Mm -mm. Oh, now Irvin's been convinced. No longer championing, 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 knight f4. Championing. Yeah, that's the word. What's wrong with the basics? What's wrong with the basics? So by basics, you mean castling? So castling is definitely the most natural move. And you should always follow opening principles, unless you have a good reason not to. The thing is, there's a very, very good reason not to in this case. And I'll give you a hint. It revolves around white's best minor piece, that minor piece being this bishop. This bishop controls the entire board and helps support our plan of playing e4, and will be a key attacker if we do get e4 to, to come through against this king's side. So with that in mind, what does, castles, uh, what does castling allow black to do here?
Yeah, so I think bishop f5 uh, is actually a bit of a mistake here because black or white has a tactic. Can anybody find the tactic? But you're on the right track. Bishop f5 is, is a really good idea. You want to trade off this bishop, yeah? Yeah, bishop e7 is a nice intermediate move. Uh, but then queen takes e7. And sorry, I'm putting my foot in my mouth here. If bishop takes here, queen takes e3, you're actually not winning a piece thanks to rook f2. So white would be winning a piece against uh, bishop f5. But the other move you suggested, knight f5, I think is, is quite powerful here. Uh, it makes a threat to the e3 pawn in tandem with the rook. So defending it is not enough. Uh, White will still be able to capture. And this would force us to trade off our beautiful, beautiful bishop for that horrible, horrible knight on e7. And we simply don't want to allow that. So this is why white shouldn't castle here. Uh, with that in mind, the move I played was simply knight g3, putting another attacker on this f5 square. This prevents black from, from bringing any piece to f5 in the near future and is, is more than enough to slow down his development. A move like knight f4 would actually be quite bad. And the reason for that is it's not keeping in line with, with our plan. The point of the f3 nimzo, which I guess I should make this more clear. I don't know if I've, I've said this. Uh, obviously, you're controlling the e4 square, but you're controlling it for the purpose of eventually breaking through in the center by playing e4 yourself. And so knight f4, while this knight looks nice, it attacks the d-pawn, it, it's near the king, it's not supporting this plan of playing e4. So it's a bad move. King f2. Everybody loves to always like play when, when they're not actually at the board. But castling is, is really nice. Castling is powerful. So I simply played knight g3, controlling this f5 square, and bishop d7. And then, OK, before we move on, one more point about this knight g3. Uh, this is why it's, it's useful to spend time in the opening. Uh, you'll see players kind of rush through the opening sometimes because they think I'll just develop my pieces and everything will be fine. But these kinds of threats uh, can be made very, very early on, and they can have a huge impact on the result of the game. So it's important to take your time and to notice things like rook e8, which just looks like a normal move, is actually creating some, some threats that you have to account for. So knight g3, bishop d7, and only now I castle. Uh, now black is in a rather unfortunate situation where it's very, very difficult to find a move to play. Uh, it seems like every move kind of just makes this position uh, worse. Maybe he'd like to move this knight out to g6, but really what is it doing? You might look at this square, and maybe this is the move he should have played, but you know, I think things are just awkward. So the move he came up with is after, sorry, after castles. Whoops, I skipped ahead. I didn't mean it. After castles, he played queen c8. So what do you think his idea is with queen to c8? I was asking myself this question in the game as well. For yeah, that's exactly right. I think this is what he was thinking, is he wanted really to trade off some of these pieces on f5. However, what is wrong with this idea? What can I do here? Queen c2? Yeah, queen c2 is actually a, a pretty nice move. But uh, I wanted to play a little bit more, more quickly. Yeah, nothing wrong with queen c2, though. Yeah? Yeah, you simply play e4. Um, the time is right. Note that it would be a mistake to play a move like e4 here. You don't always want to do these things as, as soon as you can. Uh, first of all, your king is still in the center, and this knight isn't yet on its ideal square. But once you get the knight out and you get castled, you're perfectly ready. You're, you're totally fine to play this move e4, to play your pawn break. Um, one reason I didn't want to put this queen on c2 is because after e4, and takes, takes, which is what was played in the game, it's sometimes very useful to have this queen on this diagonal to come out uh, in this direction. Um, that's true. That's true.
But pretty quickly, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see what happens uh, in the game. In the game, my opponent played knight g6. And now uh, I, it's very safe to say that, that white is, is completely winning. Um, this central advantage with e4 and d4, especially supported by this pawn on c3, is just totally, totally crushing. Um, with that in mind, how to continue? There's actually a lot of options here. So just throw out any ideas. Probably they're, they're all winning. Pawn e5, you said? Yeah, yeah that's, that's totally right. e5 is a perfectly fine move. However, you do have to be a little bit cautious because Black is going to come to d5, and he's probably aiming to, to put some of these knights on f4. But that being said, you know, every, everything is good here for white. I, I wasn't lying. So now let me rephrase the question. How do you look the coolest in your chess game? What's the coolest thing to do here? It's not very cool to just easily win. You want to you put some flair on it. You know, you've got some chess club regulars standing by your board. They're all watching. Maybe like Yasser Sarawan just came up the steps and he's contemplating your position. And you, you look up and you see him and then you play which move? A couple of people in YouTube have, have the right idea, but I won't give it away. Don't you dare read that YouTube chat, Jim. Don't read it out loud. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. Rook takes f6. Rook takes knight. You sacrifice the exchange. You impress all your friends. You get all the glory. And this is actually a really, really common motif uh, in this opening. This knight and this pawn together really hold together uh, black's entire king's side. And after rook takes f6 and pawn takes f6, every square around the king has been weakened. This knight no longer controls this very nice square for both the queen and the knight. This pawn no longer controls any dark squares around the king. And this is, this is enough to, to kind of end the game. Um, I continued with knight h5, very, very natural. You just attack this pawn. Queen d8 was his choice. And now there's no rush. You just bring the rest of your pieces into the game. Queen f3, still piling up against this f6 pawn. Rook e6 was his attempt, defending laterally. And uh, now I actually did something rather mean. I played queen e3, the point being I want to go give checkmate. To solve this problem, he plays king h8, but now simply rook f1. And this is, this is just as, as easy as chess gets. You, you bring your pieces into the game, and then uh, eventually your, your opponent kind of crumbles. Bishop c8 was the only move he could come up with. Um, I remember there was some reason why he played this move, but for the life of me, I, 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 can't, I can't remember what that reason is at the moment. Uh, I played e5 in order to really break through on this f6 square. After takes, rook takes f7, the, the game is nearing its end. Pawn takes, queen h6, queen g8, and now uh, rook g7 is, is enough to end the game. And this is, this is how the game actually went. Rook e1 check, king f2. He gives a very sneaky long check, but I can simply take this rook. And after a couple more checks, the, uh, the game is over after rook h7, knight h7, and queen g7 mate. So I, I kind of skipped through the fun bit at the end of the game, but uh, that, that last part wasn't too instructive. Uh, black was, was simply lost. The king side was fractured. All you have to do is bring your pieces into the game, and, and the rest is history. But any questions about the key part of this game? The key part is actually this opening. This is where the entire game was decided. So does everybody understand uh, how black went wrong? OK, well, keep it in mind, because we're about to see it over and over and over again, because this is how all of my games in the F3 Nimzo go. So if you want some free wins, this is the way to do it. Uh, up next on our victims list is Jason Zhao. And this was actually a rapid game here at the club in one of the Friday quads. Uh, and let's, let's just get into it. 
d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and, and once again f3. Jason played d5, which is a much better move than bishop takes c3. I played a3 now, and you can kind of really see that the difference. Bishop takes, pawn takes. Jason got castled. And I will say, a very respectable line is to play c5 here. And after takes, you can play pawn takes, but a much better line for black, I think, is to play knight takes. And I won't go into this, this type of theory, but I did want to mention that this option exists for black. Instead, though, we see castles. And after takes, now black has to play pawn takes. And we play very, very similarly to, to what we saw last game. Simply e3. We're going to develop our pieces, get castled, expand in the center, and try to checkmate the king. Bishop f5 was his choice here, however. And so what is the point of this move? If, you've, if you were paying attention last game, it, it should be pretty, pretty clear. What does black want to do here? Prevent e4? Not quite. Not quite. I mean, yes, but, but not quite. If you remember, this was, this was a move Luke E was really, really struggling to play in the previous game. And why was it going to be so preferable for him if he could play bishop f5? That's exactly right. The best square for this bishop by far is bishop d3, and this is a very, very powerful bishop. And uh, if black can get this bishop off the board, his position is actually going to be uh, much, much better than it was before. So with that in mind, how can, uh, how can you play here with the white pieces? Let me remind myself what I did. OK. <laughs> how can you play to try to take advantage of this bishop coming to f5 so early? There's a couple things you can do. G4. G4. Well, I think if we check a database, yeah, G4 is, is, a, is actually the very, very common idea. A lot of times they start with knight e2. And then after some move, let's say c5. Now I think, uh, yeah, G4 by far is, is the most common idea. And this has been played uh, a ton by a lot of very, very strong players. Uh, and the point is, you're actually going to put this bishop on g2 instead of d3, and you're still going to push in the center with e4. Now you're just going to do all of it with the pawn on g4, just, just for fun. Uh, and this is actually the, the main way of playing against this. But in the game, I did start with knight e2. And after rook e8, I, I chose kind of a simpler approach to, to this game. I didn't want to play g4 for whatever reason. I just wasn't feeling up to it on the night of. And so the move I chose was knight g3. And it's a very similar idea to g4, uh, meaning I'm attacking the bishop. And the point is, I'm just kind of gaining a tempo with this move. My knight was coming to g3 anyways, and now my opponent has to spend a tempo moving this bishop before I allow him to trade it off. Bishop g6 was his choice, and now I do just play bishop d3, and takes takes. And so I will say that g4 is a better way of playing for white here. But this is a, a simple way of playing, and we'll see. It kind of worked out in the game. Knight bd7 was my opponent's choice. And this move I'm actually going to call uh, a slight mistake. And the reason for that is this knight has no future from d7. This knight really belongs on c6. And I'll give a gold star to anybody who can tell me why. Why should this knight be on c6? And for a hint, I will tell you, it prevents e4 somehow. Not directly, but uh, it helps to prevent e4. It doesn't prevent it forever, but it does help. Someone in YouTube 
says this knight should go knight a5 to c4. To them, I would say, well, what's different about knight b6 to c4? I don't know. So yes, yeah, someone in YouTube does have it. TSJO gets the gold star. The knight belongs on c6, but the trick in my, in my phrasing was that this pawn should be on c5 first. Now let's say we castle, and now knight c6. And this is how uh, black should be playing to prevent white from pushing e4. White will always, or almost always, have enough support from his pieces with this pawn on f3 to support the e4 pawn. But by playing e4, we actually leave this d pawn behind. And this is quite often how black uh, gets around this e4 push, which can be quite, quite powerful. It's by putting pressure on d4. For example, if we just calculate here for a second, we'll see that we actually don't have enough support to play e4 just yet, because the d pawn would hang. And so this makes life, white's life a lot more difficult. Uh, you have to support this, e, this d pawn by playing some unnatural moves, maybe even like a bishop b2, which doesn't seem quite, quite natural, right, to put the bishop on this blocked off diagonal. And so this is how uh, black should be playing. Instead, though, we see knight bd7. And while this develops, it doesn't develop with a purpose. And that's really important. It's something I've said before. Um, OK, so we see king side castles, c6. And with that in mind, what I just talked about, why is c6 a bad move? What doesn't it do? It, it doesn't put pressure on d4. And so now that I've been given free reign to do whatever I want, I could play e4 immediately if I wanted to. Instead, though, I, I prepared it a bit more. I played this move rook a2 with the classic idea of bringing the rook to the center, one of, one of these central squares to support the center even further. Knight b6 was his choice. And now I do continue with, uh, with e4. Oh, and actually, though, OK, I couldn't play e4 here. I remember now. There is a trick. What would black do if, if I played e4 and we went into this line? Always got to avoid these, these tricky, tricky moves. There is a tactic here. Yeah, knight c5 is, is totally right. We, we hit the queen, we hit e4, and due to the pin, we can't capture this knight. So I would actually just be losing a pawn, which is why rook a2 prepares rook e2 to support this pawn a little further. Of course, after knight b6, knight c5 is no longer possible, so I can play e4 with uh, comfort. My opponent brings this knight to c4, but I hope everybody can see that this knight on c4, while maybe we've been told classically knights on c4 are very powerful, they control a lot of squares on the queen side, it's simply irrelevant to the game. And this knight does nothing to help this king, it does nothing to help the center. Controlling the square is irrelevant, because the square is already controlled by this pawn uh, quite easily. And so this knight ends up just being out of the game. And Due to that, I think white is, is simply winning in this position. It's, it's plus two. It's move 15, and it's plus two, which is not bad. I played rook e2, just bringing the rook into the center. Knight d7, and now f4, taking advantage of the fact that if black captures, he leaves this, this knight behind. Otherwise, you know, it'd be bad to allow black to kind of separate our pawns like this. We see b5, so now black is threatening to take on e4. And so I play e5. And it's, it's pretty clear that this, is, this has gone pretty wrong for, for black here. This knight's completely out of the game. This rook's also slightly shut out. And moves like f5 and f6 are, are going to come with devastating effect. We see knight f8 is my opponent's try. Simply f5. You play very, very simple moves. a5 came from my opponent. I played rook f4. I just want to come kill the king. f6 was his attempt to try and prevent me from playing f6 myself. Simply rook g4. Takes. And now knight h5. And, and the end is, is near. Uh, everything is, is collapsing on this g7 pawn. Uh, rook a7 was played. It's now plus 8, by the way. Queen g3. g6. Takes, takes. And then... All right, whoops, once again, win, win with style, everybody. Win with style. 
How can you win with style here? Rook takes g6. I love it. Knight takes g6. Queen takes g6. King h8. All right. And now, simply every move is winning. You get to play this beautiful little rook sacrifice. And in the game, I played bishop g5. And rook e6 was his attempt to try to keep the game going. Of course, I was threatening his queen. He tries to threaten my queen. And if I were to take this rook, he would take my bishop. But simply knight f6 is, is very, very strong. And this hurts to look at, so I won't make you look at it too much longer. Rook e7, queen h6 check. Rook h7, knight takes, rook takes. And now bishop f6 check, the meanest of the moves. Of course, I could take here and take here and be up a full rook. But bishop f6 check, really, truly a, a disgusting move. And here, my opponent resigned. Um, the point is, after king g8, I can give this check and, and now pick up the queen. Uh, so that's another like 30-some move game in the, in the F3 Nimzo. Uh, are we starting to identify some, some patterns here? Uh, Luke Yi really gave me everything I wanted. He took on C3 on his own, giving me extra time. In this game, my opponent put up uh, a much stronger resistance, but still this plan with E4 is, is quite, quite strong. And uh, unless black plays more actively on the queen side, this is just this is how the games go. This is just how it happens. Uh, all right, any questions about this game in particular, or anything we've we've talked about so far? Anybody? Is it starting to to make sense? We're recognizing the patterns. All right, let's move on to fun game number three. Uh, in true chess player style, uh, I had saved this game. I did not save my opponent's name, but I I did save their rating. So uh, <laughs> we're all just numbers in the end, I guess. But uh, see, my opponent was around 2170 rated when we played this game. I have no idea who my opponent was. Uh, I do know who I was, though. I was the white player. But once again, we were in the F3 Nimzo. Once again, my opponent played a slightly strange move here, knight c6. So we actually uh, are going to get a chance to talk about this one. And this is a little bit of a different way of playing for the black player. I think we've looked enough at, at these d5 things. Let's, let's take a look at what happens when they play a little bit differently. So I continued with a3, takes, takes. Now my opponent plays d6. So this is a little bit more of a, a classical approach to, to Nimzo type structures. Right? Okay. Sorry about that. Sound should be back. Uh, so, why might I have been refraining from playing this move? Pawn to e4. It blocks my bishop coming out. That's actually very, very close to exactly the right answer. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's a very good point. Obviously, in the other games, I was playing e4. But then almost immediately after, I was able to play this e5 move. So it wasn't really as though I was blocking this, this bishop forever. But in this case, after white plays e4, what move is, is black going to look to respond with? Yeah, that's exactly right. e5. Now my pawns are going to be locked on these light squares. 
And maybe even this, this pawn on d4 is, is going to be a, a bit of a weakness. So you do have to be uh, a little cautious here. Now, this position is totally playable for white. Uh, I'm not saying it's not. But in the game, I didn't really want to commit to this uh, just yet. So e3 instead. My opponent still plays e5. And now I get to bring my bishop here. And this diagonal is, is going to stay open for the moment. Mm. Queen e7 was my opponent's choice. I simply continue development with knight e2. Knight a5, castles, and now, uh, now b6. So here I made a decision. And that decision was to capture this knight on f6. And this wasn't actually the, the best move for white. These, this dark squared bishop is a, a pretty powerful piece. Uh, and giving it up for the knight isn't quite right. Uh, much better instead, let's see, I think is to play Rather simply, you can play a move like rook b1, just improve your pieces, start thinking about moves like e4, and eventually f4 to break open the center, and just not commit to giving up this bishop just yet. But let's roll with it. Bishop takes f6, queen f6. And now, what is the natural follow-up to, to taking on f6? I did have kind of a purpose behind it. There was a reason I wanted to play bishop f6 before, before this move. What's the natural follow-up? Knight g3. Knight g3? OK. So uh, in the previous lectures, knight g3 has been, has been the follow-up, because we wanted to prevent bishop f5, right? Uh, and if bishop f5 was possible after the move that I if, OK, so let's say I play like a nothing move. Bishop f5 is possible here. But bishop a6 might even be stronger, just uh, hitting the c4 pawn, and looking to trade off the bishops via c4 rather than uh, f5. So I have to do something a little more active rather than knight g3. This, uh, OK, so I will say, while you guys are thinking, the ideas here, uh, while they look pretty different than the last games we looked at, it's still all about opening up these files for the rooks, opening up or keeping open this diagonal and finding ways to, to bring the pieces into the game. So in the previous game, games that was done via e4 and then e5 and then pushing this pawn forward. In this game, we still want to open things up, but it's going to be a little bit different. So yeah, Brian? F4? Yeah, f4 is, is entirely right. That's what I played in the game. Uh, like I said, you're just looking for ways to open up the position. And by threatening pawn takes pawn, you're trying to get this rook into the game. And I think this is actually pretty nice for white. And then you can't play e4 if it's like you got rid of it? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, if I had played f4 here, I was a little concerned about this move e4. And while I could still capture this, and he would be forced to capture back with the pawn, otherwise I could take here, um, I didn't want to allow uh, my opponent to kind of shove this pawn in my face, especially with the c pawn hanging. So this is why I had to take on f6. This also uh, kind of increases the power of f4 by putting the queen opposite the rook. But let's continue. Queen e7 was my opponent's choice, just trying to step out of everything. And now, of course, I want to open things up, so I take on e5. No reason not to. Pawn takes e5. And now I do continue with this move, knight g3. Like I said, it's, it's all about opening up uh, files and diagonals and keeping them open in this f3 nimzo. So knight g3 still prevents this move e4 from black, which would block out my bishop. My opponent plays g6, the point being he wants to keep this knight out of these annoying squares f5 and h5. Continue with queen f3, and my opponent plays bishop a6. And this is a key moment in the game. Uh, there's actually only one move that keeps an advantage for white here. Only one move on the entire chessboard to keep an advantage. Black's idea is very, very simple. He wants to take the c4 pawn. And now I've been saying uh, all along, the whole point is to open up diagonals and, and files. And so that's the idea behind this move. How can we continue to open up this king side and get at the black king? I'll give you some time. Queen f6. So uh, 
That, that's one idea. I'm going to let some ideas come, and then I'll, I'll talk about them in order. So queen f6 is one idea. Like I said, this is, this is a tough one, so I'll give you some time. The YouTube chat has gone quiet. OK, they have, they have some ideas, some very good ideas. Knight f5. Uh, so knight f5 is the move that I played. And this is actually the only move to keep an advantage. Queen f6 is actually not really keeping in line with, with uh, our ideas here. You might be looking to do one of these sacrifices, but by allowing this trade of queens, you're really giving up too much. And things like bishop takes c4 are going to come too quickly for uh, any sacrifices to be, to be useful. Um, so when you're trying to attack like this, trading queens, not always the best idea, especially when your opponent has a huge structural edge on you. Uh, this, this weakness on c4 is, is a huge problem. So the best move, the only good move for white, is, is knight f5. And uh, I, I, I'm still, to this day, years later, quite happy with myself for playing it. But uh, now I get to talk about it on the internet, which is great. My opponent rose to the challenge and captured this knight. Of course, he, he kind of has to. He's kind of forced to capture this. Um, attacking both this queen and this pawn, there's no real good way to solve both threats. If you play queen g5, does anybody see a, a winning move here for white? There is one, but can you see it? Yeah, simply h4. Removes the defender from the h6 pawn. And if queen h5, do we take this queen? No. Good answer. But why not? What do we do instead? This is a fun one. Knight e7. Yeah, this move is, is good. Um, the funniest move, though, and I think the best move, is g4. And this queen is locked in a, in a deadly corridor of pawns, and there's no escape. <laughs> uh, this knight, very useful, defends h4. Um, OK, so not queen g5. Instead, pawn takes knight, the only real move worth considering. Uh, queen takes f5. Obviously, I want to checkmate my opponent. My opponent played the only move, f6, defending laterally. And now how do we continue the attack? We're down a full piece. How do we continue the attack? Yeah? I want to rook with. Exactly. You just bring more pieces into the game. Rook f3. You play very natural chess. You don't have to panic because you gave up a piece. You just have to play good natural chess. A huge mistake would be playing a move like, like queen g6 check. This is simply helping your opponent by giving him time to use his queen to defend his king. So rook f3 instead. My opponent rises to the challenge again, plays bishop takes c4. And this was actually his, his fatal mistake here. Um, he had to continue defending his king uh, with a little bit more urgency, right? Uh, you don't have time here to, to be grabbing this pawn. He was probably thinking he was grabbing this pawn and defending his king by, by trying to trade off these bishops and control some of these squares. But the fact of the position is it, it doesn't do enough. So what's a better defensive move for black, I will ask before we move on? How can he kind of start uh, a mad dash uh, with, with the king to escape all of this horrible, horrible business. Rook f7 is, is totally right. Give yourself a little escape route. Use this rook as a blocker in front of your king. This, this really helps, uh, helps black out here. Um, that being said, I think white is actually still doing, doing quite well. Uh, I don't have all the variations in front of me, but um, things like rook g3 and king f8 and queen g6 are, are good ideas. For rook g7, there's always moves like queen h6 to look out for. And uh, white's going to have a, a lot of compensation for the piece. It's, it's going to be quite good still. Um, instead, though, we see bishop takes c4. Of course, I continue with the check. No, I don't continue with the check, because I'm 
very, very smart. Um, so bishop e4 is a nice in-between move, hitting this rook and actually defending the d5 square for moves like pawn to d5 to come into play later. We see rook a d8. Now I do give this check. And after king h8, uh, hold on. Yeah, king h8, I do want to mention, never mind. I was deciding if I wanted to show a tactic here or later. I'll show it later. So king h8 first. Um, I play very, very naturally. Rook g6 hits an h6 pawn. This rook comes to h7, I'm trying to defend along the seventh rank a little bit. Simply rook takes h6 is enough. Uh, king to g8, and now rook g6, king f7. And how does white win from this position? How do you do it? Where's the win? What was that? D5. D5? It's a good idea, but not quite. All right, I'll get to you in a I think you've got it. I'll get to you in a second. Uh, D D5 doesn't do enough. It's, it's more forcing than D5. Yeah, someone in YouTube has it as well. Yeah. Queen H5? No, not Queen H5. Got to be more forcing. All right, Brian, what's, what's the move? Uh, I'm not so sure. Rook g7 is absolutely right. Rook g7 check, putting the rook on pre or on pre's to the king. If the king runs to e8, of course there is rook takes queen, winning uh, enough material to justify all your sacrifices. And if king takes rook, of course, queen h7. Not queen g6, but queen h7, with a nice checkmate, using black's pieces against him, as well as this bishop. And that is, is how this game should have ended. Instead, though, my opponent was very mean and made me play on up a queen. And the game continued for a few more moves. And eventually, uh, we got here. And this is, this is forced me. Um, well done, though. Rook g7, uh, a favorite tactic of mine to, to win a game. Uh, so once again, the F3 Nimzo uh, is all about opening up these lines, opening up these files, and trying to use this in the center to your advantage. And uh, that's not unique to the F3 Nimzo. That can be applied to pretty much any opening you play. Uh, you want to open up uh, lines for your pieces, uh, especially on the side of your board, on the side of the board where you have an advantage. And in that case, this is the king's side for white. You just want to make the most of your pieces. And that's what I did in this game. It's what I did in those first two games as well. And, and that's all you have to do if you want to play the F3 Nimzo like a pro. Um, I think that's going to be the last game I go over for the night. We do have a little bit of time left over. Any questions about the F3 Nimzo in general? Any, anything about the plans for either side? Yeah? Can you explain again? So it's not a bad response. Let's go back to uh, this, this Jason Zhao game. Uh, this one, he played d5. And this is by far the, the most popular response to, to f3. It's d5. It makes sense, right? You control e4. But the reason I don't like it for black is because white kind of has this, this cookie cutter plan where uh, if you don't play the most accurately, uh, it, it's very simple for white to play. I put my bishop on d3, I put my knight on g3, I castle, I play e4, I win the game. I've had dozens of games go like this. And this is why you have to really know your stuff if you're going to play like this um, with black. I will say, uh, in, in my memory, I don't know if I've lost any games in this line over the board, except to one player, that player being Daro Schwirtz, the almost 2700 rated chess player, so he, uh, he was kind enough to, to show me how this, this opening should be played. And I will say, 
if you do want to play this opening, you should really play whoops, this move, if my mouse will allow it, c5 here, putting pressure on this d4 pawn. This is something that Daro did. This is something that you should do as well. You need this pressure on d4 in order for this opening to, to work at all. And uh, I will say, the reason that this opening is playable for black is not just because of this pressure on d4, but because black has a very nice way to actually trade off these bishops. So if you do want to play this line with the black pieces in, in this manner, keep in mind you don't want to develop this knight right away. You want to get castled and play b6. And as soon as you can, you can trade this bishop not via f5, but via this a6 square. And this is the kind of prescribed way of actually playing this d5 system with black. Now, I don't think this has ever been played against me over the board, this, this line specifically. Daro did something else that is also very combative. But uh, if you do want to play like this with black, this is, this is how it should be done. But even this, I, I, do, I do quite favor for white. Uh, OK, any other questions? All right, I think I'm going to call the lecture here then. Uh, once again, this has been the F3 Nimzo and what you shouldn't do with black and what you should do with white. So thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. Uh, this has been The Road to 2000, and I'll see you guys next week.